Hello, my fellow readers. This is I, Dark Symphony Simpson, Simpson, back with a new fan fiction review. As always, a link to the story will be in the description below. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, click on that bell for notification, and leave a comment in the comment section below on your thoughts of the story. And finally, this is my opinion. My opinion is not indicative of everyone in the world. So, crossovers. You really get the idea of honestly crazy and kooky stuff from crop fan fiction crossovers. Some make sense, like anything related to Super Smash Brothers, that's already a crossover, and then you, you get the weird, the weird crossovers, like this one. I'm, I against I, me against you. I, when I first found the story years, a couple years ago, and at the time, when I, not, not a couple years ago, like around the time it was nearing completion, I didn't, I was just flabbergasted over like what crossover it was <laughs> oh i because it's it's such a weird concept like even amongst fan fictions it's like it's such a weird mix of like two different shows because this story is a crossover between on one side, you have My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, you know, Colorful Ponies, uh, Friendship and Sunshine and Lollipops, and whatever Fluttershy is, or better yet, whatever Pinkie Pie is. And on the other, you got a bunch of idiots in a box cannon in the middle of nowhere in Red vs. Blue. You, you see the disconnect. <laughs> The disconnect is real with this story because I was, I was like, there's no way. There's just no way that the two stories can work because it's My Little Pony and Reverse Blue. I'm like, you got, you got the stuff with My Little Pony, but then you got Reverse Blue, which is just like very adult oriented, very curse, more centered around like adult comedy. And I was like, there's no way there's. No way the author can make this work. And then I read it, and I and as I was reading, it's like, oh my god, the author is actually making this work. And then we got near the end of the story, and everything kind of just fell apart. Mm. Now this, now before I get to what happens near the end, I want to get to do the general overview and stuff like that. So let's get started. So what's the plot? The plot actually starts off with a classic red versus blue bit with um, Spike and Twilight doing the very famous why are we here quote. This is actually a very well-known running gag between in red versus blue. This is actually the whole point of the very first episode. So it's a very nice callback. Um, and before I continue, I might as well just lay some groundwork on the timeline. In My Little Pony, it, this story takes place between seasons three and four. So no Twilight Corn. No T-Rex and stuff like that. No, especially no Socialist Pony and Starlight Glimmer. Whatever. I, I don't even. I don't even know that much about Starlight Glimmer. I, all I know is like she did like a whole Wally thing. I, I don't know anything about that. And she also looks like a Karen, <laughs> Pony Karen. Um, and then with Red vs. Blue, uh, the story actually takes place right at the end of season five of the Blood, Blood Chronicles, which is. Uh, seasons one to five, uh, the Red vs. Blue series actually goes one to five, Blood Gold Chronicles, six, seven, and eight, uh, Recollection Trilogy, um, season nine and season ten are officially called Project Freelancer, seasons eleven to thirteen, pro um, the Chorus Trilogy, season fourteen is more just a singular thing, uh, and season fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen are what's I don't really know what they're called. I know they're I know it's actually a trilogy involving like. AI, like, AIs who were, like, convinced they're gods and, and stuff like that. Stuff with, like, Donut. That's all I really know. So, I, I, I to me, see, Rivers Blue ended at the end of course, and, and, or maybe season 14 with the whole random nonsense stuff. That's just me. That's just honestly where I see the story should have ended. Didn't need to, really didn't need to continue any more longer than that. But there, there's a timeline. So, uh, 
they do the classic so anyway back to twilight and spike they do the classic why are we here bit they see a new constellation being made and a star crash in the distance and then twilight gets a letter from not from princess celestia but princess luna who's kind of there doing secrets and stuff uh because apparently it wasn't a star that crashed it was a ship a very specific ship i'm, I'm as far as I know, a lot of people probably didn't see a lot of the old versus blue, but let me let me just clarify what happened. So at the end of season five of versus blue, uh, Agent Texas, otherwise known as Beta, otherwise known as Allison, uh, beat up the Red versus blues, took a ship that land that landed there, repaired it, uh, took another character by the name of Agent, Wy Agent Wyoming, who recently died, took his helmet. And attached and attached wires to the helmet in, uh, in order to allow the ship to travel vast distances. A sort of in in story, it's called a slip slave, um, a slip space drive. And also locked a couple AIs uh, called Gamma and Omega inside her and the ship, respectively, in order to do stuff. It's eventually revealed that she was trying to keep them contained and lost control and and stuff like that. However, there was a stowaway called Andy the Bomb, and he was placed there by the Reds to blow up, basically just destroy the ship, stuff like that. So what happened was Tex started piloting the plane, activated the slip space drive, and basically achieved warp speed, but Andy blew up, destroying the ship, causing it to crash. In Reverse of, in Reverse of Blue, it actually crashes in Valhalla, but in this story, it crashes into Equestria. So the ship actually crashes there. Twilight and the rest of the ponies are invited. They see the crash. They see the ship. They actually see the body of Agent Texas. And so Twilight's curiosity gets the better of her. She basically, you know, puts her, uses her magic to kind of go into the, into the computer programming of the, of the ship and inadvertently accesses uh, releases Gammon, also causes the slipstream drive to activate, transforming uh, Twilight to Blood Gulch. And so that's where the story completely actually kicks off. It's very humorous at first. Like, it's literally just the red versus, like, the, it's literally just more silly adventures of the red versus blue, but Twilight's there. Just, just kind of going insane over what? Oh, it's humans! First contact. I gotta be a master. And then she sees what to do. It's like, th this is how you people fight? This is how you people confuse? What? Why? <laughs> and so she gets, you know, we get officially acquainted with the reds and, and blues, how they work, how they behave. Uh, Doc is there too. and But Doc just... Just Doc. <laughs> he just, just he disappears after they leave Blood Bowl Draw, I think, except for like one other cameo. Oh, but he's he's there too. Uh, so you know the reds and blues are fighting. It's like it's time for a good day to kill some blues. Yeah, second blue. I mean, second red. Ah, son of a bitch. <laughs> and, and stuff like that, and all and all the and all the crazies, all the crazy stuff. Uh, while the rest of Twilight's friends are actually freaking out because you know Twilight's gone. She literally disappeared, and it's like you gotta go home. See, you know we're gonna we're gonna try and do research and stuff like that. So they go home. Uh, Twilight asks the Reds and Blues to see if they help them. The um, church says, no, fuck no. Fuck no. I ain't doing that shit. Go. <laughs> uh, she goes, you know, she kind of sticks with the Red. She kind of is held hostage by the Red base. She actually becomes friends with a, um, with Richard Simmons, who actually makes a headset, uh, a homemade headset for her, because it's like, hey, we're kind of great minds to collect. And so, you know, Twilight actually you know, become, like, slight friends. And even, and even when, like, Twilight wants to go home, Richards is like, I want to help you, but it's not following orders, so I can't, my hands are tied. So it's like, you know, so she manages to get Church to come along, mainly because he and reveals that Tex, and, well, the ship, and by extension, Texas is there, and he, like, wants to say goodbye, and, you know, wants to see Tex and all that stuff, like, closure and stuff like that so they try and travel to get a ship to get to equestria what happens is a lot of shenanigans including a very hilarious moment where they're at where during in between events of season five and season six they come across a military checkpoint 
Uh, what happened is Tucker and Church are trying to figure out a way to like get get Twilight to go with Church because one, they don't want Twilight to get experimented on alien style, and two, Church is really the only one willing to help Twilight and it kind of be in their best interest for them to just you know be able to travel together. So what happens is Tucker holds up a dog a dog basket like a dog container and. Twilight is like, she looks at it and it's like, she she literally looks at, she looks at the sky, hoping, hoping Princess Celestia can hear her. It's like, and so Twilight becomes a dog. <laughs> Complete with her going bark, 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 bark. Uh, and really not liking it. And even Church is like, uh, she's my dog. It's like, yeah, we don't love pets. Uh, she's my CNI dog. What? Yeah, bad, I'm bad with my sniper rifle. She, she, she barks once for yet for if I'm in the wrong direction, and twice, and twice is that I'm on point. And then he like aims the sniper rifle at Caboose, and he's like intentionally like aiming it far away. And then Twilight does so bark, 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 bark. <laughs> See? But there's like no. We can't do that. <laughs> so they pick up Twilight. They can't, they carry her into the base. Wyoming shows up. Yeah, he survives. Uh, takes one look at Twilight. Said, "Yeah, I know who you are, Pony. We, I know you can talk." And Twilight breaks out, runs away. Wyoming gets all of Project Freelancers to go after her. And Twilight manages to escape Project Freelancer. We then go all the way. She manages to find her way to help. Um, church, they run into Agent Washington as well. Washington wants to help them defeat Project Freelancer as well. Uh, when they get to church, uh, Wyoming show actually showed up in a very, in probably one of my favorite moments in the story where, where you know, T Twilight does the barking thing. He's like, oh, ho, ho, I got you right where you want you. It's like, it's like, I know you can't aim worth a damn. And then Twilight goes, bark. <laughs> Bark. It's like, that pony stopped at the season. Got it. Bark, bark. Ah, my shoulder. <laughs> and then Church is like, holy shit, I finally hit something. <laughs> I actually, I, I actually really love that moment because it's like, yes. <laughs> All the times where Church complained about, I can't hit a damn thing and now I can. <laughs> All I need is a colorful purple pony barking for me. Uh, so they escape. So they escape Wyoming. They manage to team up with uh, Washington to help out. They get some reds and blues. They kind of give them time to to be able to use the, uh, the computer at the seaside base where part of Reverse the Blue took place. I don't remember what that map is called. I just know it's an actual map in the game. It has the gigantic windmill. I, I guess I don't know. I don't really know. And they find that the only nearby base a ship that has a slip space a slip space device is the mother of invention which is the mobile base for project freelancer it is their their big base is literally a ship the size of a city like that's it's gigantic so with the help of washington they managed to get in wyoming realizing needs some help and he's like um i'm gonna kill two birds with one stone get some revenge and and get the pony uh reds Oh, this is, the, this is Blood Gold Alpha, Post Alpha One. Uh, can I help you? Yes. Oh, wait, why do I sound like you? Never mind. I need, I need help with those dirty blues. Yeah. I'll get some and Chirp and Griff on the double. <laughs> and stuff like that. So Wyoming literally just calls the blue, the reds, uh, church, and with the help of Washington, they all, oh, they also grab. They also grab caboose. Like I completely forgot they grab caboose because I didn't like that part where they grab caboose. I thought it was like eh, eh, eh. I never really liked that part even in the show. So, eh. so you know it is what it is. They grab. They have also have caboose. Uh, Act one ends with Twilight activating the subspace drive, going back her caboose and Church, going back to Equestria, where Church and Caboose are like getting mugged. And also, the meta finds his way into Equestria. That's how Act One. That's how Act One ends.
Legends, with where Twilight Church and Caboose coming to Equestria along with the meta who's after Gamma and Omega. That's how that's more or less how Act One ends. Act two picks up with them on Equestria. Um, the red, the reds find out. They said, "Hey, wait a minute! The ship's going to Equestria. Why are they going? Why are they going to plan that Twilight Spur, Twilight Spunkle and Spankle are going to already?" <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> because apparently, Project Freelancer has some kind of connection with Princess Celestia, and also another pony by the name of Sunset Shimmer. And coincidentally, near the end of Act One, we're introduced. The Sunset Shimmer, who basically turns, uh, not get Omega. Think I think it's Omega. Gamma's the one that goes to Shizno stuff like that. I leave Omega. No, that's Sigma. Yeah, yeah, Omega. Omega is the one who becomes O'Malley and stuff like that. And so Sunset turns, uh, Omega into a AI and are not an AI, an MI. Which is basically a, a magical version of an AI. So complete with like the whole AI joke, like A M I. What's the M? Magical intelligence. Oh. <laughs> and so they find themselves on a quest. So the Reds, it's literally just Caboose and Church, and basically Twilight inadvertently kind of goes up, separates them. Uh, Twilight tries to get her friend to let her know what's happening, while Church and Caboose. Uh, they get hit by a mob. They get, they get like tied up. Caboose acts like lawyer. Princess Celestia shows up, realizes, oh no, and lets them go. So you're like, yeah, these aren't the po these aren't the ponies that did it because well, we know who did it, which is a character name, which is Meta, or otherwise known as Main, if you're in if you know the lore of Rose and Blue. Uh, so they basically more of a relaxing period where. You know, they're trying to, like, figure everything out. Like, where's Tex? Where, and, find, and they also find out about the meta. Twilight realizing that Project Freelancer is in space because the Reds, I shit you not, decided to take a pelican in the ship down that is tied to a warthog. And they're playing they're playing the whole classic warthog music. Da, 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 da. I, actually, I actually love that song. It's actually pretty fun. And of course, they make like a big entrance and stuff like that. And so now we're kind of getting into more character driven stuff. Like, we kind of like Washington. Like, Washington ends up being there. He's actually. He's, he's there. And then the second act is basically the, just them having to go back to the base. That way they can get Epsilon after the reveal that text basically tells Church. It's like. Yeah, you're an AI. You know what? And basically the whole plan is to get uh, Project Freelancer, and specifically the director, Leonard Church, arrested by the subcommittee headed by Winston Hargrove. I believe it's called... I believe his name is Winston Hargrove. Uh, but, he, you know, anyone who knows Red Blue knows that Hargrove is not exactly a nice guy either. And as the story goes on, they go back to... Quit, they go back to... Um, the area where Red Blue took place, uh, they go all this stuff. They actually rewrite history, like the whole part with finding Epsilon. Like in the actual show, season seven actually ends with Washington and Church about to fight a full power meta, and Washington's about to activate the EMP, and it's like, well, no. And then Church goes, well, no, we're going to activate the M because I'm a motherfucking ghost <laughs> and activate that this time. Texas actually hilariously lampshades the show. It's like, well, there's an EMP, but um, you have to be an idiot to do that. So I'm just gonna blow the sh I'm just gonna blow this entire facility up with C4. <laughs> and so they help. Uh, the same thing kind of happened. Similar things happens. Like they get rid of all of the AIs. Uh, there is a time where Pinky kind of becomes infested by O'Malley and obligatory, I believe, obligatory cupcakes reference because oh, uh, it's getting kind of annoying at this time that literally every single My Little Pony fan fiction and involves Pinky has to reference that god dang story. It is what it is. <laughs> but back to the plot, they hit why, they hit, they hit Maine with the um, 
for, uh, with the whole orbital friendship later, i.e. the element of harmony, gets rid of all the AIs that he, and the, two, the MI he had, which is like, he gets everything, uh, church or alpha, doesn't die and stuff like that. And then, and the series ends with uh, them going back to, uh, Arc Act 2 ends with them going back to Equestria to prepare for Project Freelancer, um, and also something to do with, with Sister, I'm gonna explain more about that later. But I. But then we come to Act Three. Oh boy, Act, Act Three. Uh, I. I'm gonna let, I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't like Act Three. Act One and Act Two were fine. Were fun. Were good stories. Uh, because, but I'm gonna it, be incredibly glossing over Act Three mainly because a lot of the important stuff happens in this act including like a random psa about shipping it's more joke chapter but that's fine but act, but i'm not gonna go too much into act three all i will say is there's like they have to go and find uh the, the why they have to find out why project freelancer is there in the first place it has something to do with uh whatever the contact was back then when Celestia and the director first met. That's all, that, for the most part, that's all I'm going to say on Act 3. Like, just the general part of what Act 3 is going to be doing. And that is just setting up the big climax between the ponies and, Re and reds and blues versus Project Freelancer. I don't want to spoil anything there, mainly because, like I said, there's just so much that happens in this act, it kind of, I don't want to spoil it. But let me just say, there's a lot of big revelations and big set pieces and stuff like that. People die and everything, and and lots of revelations. And like I said, a lot of stuff happens. And the story ends with everything kind of settling. Like um, Winston Hargrove shows up on behalf of the USC subcommittee says that we're going to engage in first protocol contact, all the remaining members of Project Freelancer, they're being arrested and stuff like that. And then we get a big sequel hook involving Chorus, which is basically the, which is basically represented in Reverse Blue as seasons 11, 12, and 13. So there's a, there's a lot of sequel hooks that happen in the very, in the last chapter and the, and the epilogue. There's a lot of stuff that happens there. But overall, the plot is actually pretty decent. Like I said, I don't want, like I said, I'm not going to talk about the act, the overall structure of act three too much, because honestly act one and act two are basically just there to set up all the pieces for act three. And it kind of be, and I don't really like to do spoilers. Granted, I'm going to get a little bit spoiler esque at the end when I talk about what I would change, but I liked Act 1, I liked Act 2, every, but Act 3, that's, that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about. Characters! The, there are a lot of characters, let's talk about the two main ones, because honestly, these are the two that kind of get the most development time, and that is Church and Twilight. I really love these characters, like, there is... There is, which I honestly think is the best part of the story, is there's all, pretty much all the characters are good. Like, every single character, from the major characters, to the mind characters, to the cameos, to the side characters, every single character is put to production. Like, um, like during the whole desert thing, like, when they go to, when they go to the desert, uh, we're introduced to a character called uh, Commander Eberly, who is... I, who, based on the TV trust page of it, is based off a character from from the Rooster Teeth team, and you know she becomes friends with Rarity for a short time, and then they get and then they get dragged up to CT. Rarity gets PTSD because she tries that whining thing that you know in My Little Pony that that kind of became well known for her when she gets captured by the Diamond Dogs and she starts whi like whining like stop complaining no. Stop whining. No, I am not whining. I am complaining. This is whining and, and stuff like that. But when she tries it with CT, he just calmly pulls out a gun, shoots Eberly in the face. And yeah, yeah, you're worth more to me 
than she is. And let that know to stop talking. And it gives her PTSD. That kind of drives her character in the second half of the story. It's a very big moment. Like, there is, there is a lot of moving pieces. But in terms of Twilight and Church, their continued interaction with them over the course of the story, like, we start with Twilight. She's like, Twilight is basically, you know, if you know what My Little Pony is, you know how Twilight character works. She's very adorable. She's very smart. Very OCDS. Like, constantly, like, making lists. Constantly worried about... Constantly worrying about Princess Celestia letting her down, like, and letting her down and all that. But at the end of the story, she turns into a very snarky character who likes to comment on everything and likes to, you know, she even cur- like she even curses once or twice. Uh, all, all from spending all this time with Church. And the, sa- and the same can be said with Church. Like, Church is, of course, the snark guy. He's the guy who com- who basically sarcastically comments on everything. Like me. And constantly just annoys everyone. It's like, Caboose, shut up! And, you know, he does lots of cursing, lots of snide comments. But as he's hanging out with Twilight, he becomes nicer. He becomes more willing to help people and pick them up. And he just want, and it got to the point where he's basically wants to protect Equestria, not so much for any selfish reason, but because damn yeah, friends with Twilight. I want to be, I want to protect her. I want to help her out. I want to get out of that. <laughs> and it's a very nice thing. Both of their characters are just entwined to the point where if they were separate, that they just work well together. Like they just gel. And I, I, like I said, this the characters themselves are the strongest part of this entire story because the care because there's so many characters to re- um, interactions like between Fluttershy and Griv, AJ and Sarge, Tucker and Rarity, Donut and Rarity, Twilight and Caboose, Twilight with Tucker, Twilight not not really Tucker, Twilight and Church, Twilight and Wyoming. There's just so much character interactions and compare character and intertwining character development it's it's amazing like and even they're just like and even the minor characters like you would you would understand that it's like oh there's probably like some kind of badly written character probably not what the main ones probably what the side ones like um everly and stuff like that it's like no there's all the characters are used to perfection it's just insane the amount of detail the author puts into these characters themselves same thing with the pacing. The pacing is really magnificent. It really follows a classical three-act storyline with the first and with the first act setting up the events of the second act, and then the first and second one setting up all the events for Act Three to plateau and climax and even itself out. It works well. It is such magnificent level of care, of world building, of sentence structure, of characters. Everything is per is just completely perfect on that front. Even like the weaker parts in Act Three are still done really well, despite the fact they're just Act Three is just such a confusing, weird mess that it's not even funny. Uh, grammar errors, no grammar errors, and sentence structure and stuff like that. It's fine, and at all. Um. But with the end of the first part, nearly 30 minutes to just talk about the plot. Oh boy. I'm not going to say whether or not I recommend this because I want you, I want everyone to hear what I have to say next. I don't have, I don't normally do this. Like I literally, this would probably be the first time I officially do this. But I am going to issue a spoiler warning. It, it, I, because I want to talk about in detail one specific plot point in Act 3. I'm not going to talk about the entirety of Act 3. Because I still want... Because I, there's still a lot to love about that part. But I honestly... this I want to show why this specific part... Um nearly wanted me to not recommend the story because this part was just so badly handled that it just it completely 
Well, this and one other part, but I'm not going to talk about that other part. Okay. It involves the meta, don't worry. That if you're, if you're, I will have to say, if you're going to, if I did recommend it, I would recommend, I actually would recommend it. And my favorite part is, of course, probably a lot of stuff. This, I'm going to talk about favorite part at the, after this. But if you don't want to be spoiled by the story, I would suggest stopping the video right here and read the story. Like, actually read the story. Like, I, like I said, I don't do this. This will be the first official time where I said spoiler warning and so all that jazz. But this is important enough that I have to talk about it. And, and it's just that badly handled. So I'll just give you a couple seconds to pause it, and we'll read the story, and then you can go back and read. All right, there, there we go. So Twilight, as an AI, or am I? How we want to? How we want to do it? That didn't work. It. It was such. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know where to start with this gigantically bundled mess of a reveal. The idea, like the basis idea itself, is that uh, the director came to Equestria, met uh, met Celestia, and they tried to, you know, create MIs and stuff like that. And Celestia Shimmer wanted to basically be uh, wanted to be a good student and stuff like that. Started creating like all these offensive stuff. Celestia didn't like it because she was still hurting because of Luna. Uh, Sunset went off the deep end kind of mentally and created Ancora, who became Twilight Sparkle, as a sort of debug for the director to use to fix Agent Texas and get rid of that failure. Because in lore, Texas is representative of Alpha's failure. So no matter how hard she tries, she will always fail in the end. And the director knew this, so he created uh, Ancora, hopefully to fix that problem as a it's sort of a as a sort of patch to like programming or gaming stuff like that. I didn't have a problem with the a with the idea, and the execution of idea wasn't was okay. But the reveal of Twilight being an AI was so, was just so bad. Like that, like, it was so bad that I nearly gave up on the story, right? And we weren't even, I wasn't even at the end. That's how badly the reveal was goofed. Like, again, like, like, uh... Like, in Act 3, not only, like, this wasn't the only thing that was wrong with Act 3. There was a lot wrong with Act 3. Kind of like another story which had a three-act system. Access. But, but honestly, this was the chief among them. That reveal that Twilight was an MI. That was just, I was, I literally stopped reading and tried to go back and remember all the stuff that, built up to it. It's like, this is just so... And as I remembered more and more about all the all the hints, all the clues, all the backstory, it, it, it kind of caused the whole idea and the reveal to fester and become worse than it actually is. So... How... The reveal is set up as Washington... Church, Simmons, and Twilight are in a are in what's called a Dyson sphere. So it's like a machine that covers that basically blocks all the star. If you're in a fan, if you're a fan of Yu-Gi-Oh, there's actually a Yu-Gi-Oh card, a rank nine card called Dyson Sphere number nine. And as they go up and wander around, we're getting we're constantly cut to Celestia, who's kind of talking about her relationship with Sunset Shimmer, and it's like, oh well, Sunset Shimmer created an MI. So, and it's like, okay, where are you going with this? And so what happens is Twilight enters a room with a glowing dart that's blocked off by a magic room. She enters it, the MI attacks her, and she starts freaking out. And at the same time, we go back to Celestia, who's like, well, I did magic to basically turn the Ancora MI into a young 
pony and it's like no no and it's like oh it's it's twilight it's god dang twilight because I I just had so many problems with this reel. Uh, the I like I said the ID the idea was technically sound. It's just that 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 reveal was so badly handled. Let's 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 kind of run it down. Over the course of the story, we're getting hints that Twilight is more than what she is. All right, that's fine. That's common. That's co that's like a common My Little Pony trait. There's like half of the stories has Twilight Ruby and reveal as something she's more than she actually is. It's not new. It's something that's been done in various My Little Pony stories, like Upheaval and Apathos and Apiotis by uh, Day Train and stuff like that. There's lots of stories that kind of follow the trend. So I thought, okay, I'm fine. Nothing too big, but I was like, and then the first hints of it were like, oh, she's an AI. That's, like, the first hints were like, oh, she's like an AI. That's fine. Sure, it could work, but we need we need something more. And then, I kid you not, it swerves into basically political scandal. Because it's revealed that tw that Princess Celestia was hanging around a specific pony of a royal house. And they were seen together all the time. And, they might, and then they disappeared. For nine months, and then when she came back, so was a pony that entered into the adoption cycle. A pony called Twilight Sparkle. So, so I'm like, so is she an AI, or is she Celestia's daughter? Because honestly, either idea would, at the time would have been fine. But as the story went on and on, all throughout Act Two. It just, it became such a confusing mess because it kept leaning into that she's Celestia's daughter, but then constantly ignoring, like, all the AI stuff. Like, okay, if she's an AI, why, why are we not getting any backstory into Celestia's relationship with Sansa Shimmer, or even better, her relationship with the director? Because a lot, a large portion, portion of what may, would have made this reveal work is if we knew what kind of relationship Sunset, Celestia, and the director had, which didn't happen. And so when, and it kept, it just kept shoveling things onto, you know, she's Celestia's daughter. Like when Sunset and Celestia fight and Celestia basically tells Sunset she can no longer a student, she's actually holding a baby Twilight in a basket and it's basically, well, not, not, oh, you're not going to listen to her. And she cuts herself off and Celestia connects to us with mom. And it's like, she gets mad. So, so with all these basically obvious hints, but nothing to connect, which may, you know, which kind of heavily implies that, okay, it is Twilight's, Twilight is Celestia's daughter. And then the that makes the reveal of the of Twilight being an MI so underwhelmingly disappointing. I wasn't even well, I wasn't even disappointed. I was mad, like genuinely mad when I got this part because like you 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 bullish, you dunced that up so bad. Why was there no why didn't we get in, any insight into his relationship with the director's relationship with Celestia? Why didn't we get any? death into the relationship of the director and Sun Shimmer. Why didn't we get any backstory to Celestia? Because she was in Act 2 and Act 3. She was such an integral character that I thought, I honestly thought when I first read this story, like years ago, that we were going to get some kind of Celestia backstory. Kind of explaining her side and, and kind of going into her character. But that never happened. And then we're just in such a haphazard, lackadaisical way. She basically goes, "Oh, Twilight. Oh, yeah, we had a am I? I turned am I into a pony with purple, and I and I put her in a doctor's. Um, I'm like, why? Why couldn't you just take the easy way out? Left her the daughter because you built that up to such a goddamn ridiculous degree, only to literally Russo swerve." 
And I can't believe I'm literally, literally calling a, a story swerve Russo. That's bad. That is just so bad. Like, that is, that's, that's just so bad. It's like, oh. Like I said, the if it was, if Twilight turned out to be Celestia's daughter, and like the big, and the big reveal was actually a separate AI called Ankora, I, I would, I would say, fine, you know, give us the obvious, but no, it, the author had to pot, like vaguely, very vaguely hint that Twilight might be an AI, and then spent fear, like who knows how many chapters kind of shoveling evidence onto the fact that, oh, she might be Celestia's daughter, and only to just go, I don't know, she is an AI. In the worst way possible, it leaves a it left a colossus a bad taste, like a toxic taste in my mouth. The idea really should have, like, honestly, it, it really nearly ruined my enjoyment of the story. Because I liked, I liked everything up to that point, except for except for the self swords that are introduced in Act Three. I honestly think they were just very underwhelming. They, they served their purpose as cannon fodder, but it was just very underwhelming. And it and it got worse after that. It just like this. This reveal was the beginning of several chapters worth of just crap. I'm not going to talk about those because I want you to read, just read them. But the reveal itself was just so, just so badly handled that it, it, it just made the story not worth wanting to finish, like, is it gonna be worth reviewing the story? I have a feeling uh, the author is probably gonna get like take their a very understandable umbrage with this. And like I said, this is my opinion. Like, but I can legitimately see the author just getting pissed off about this. The AI thing, the AI reveal would have been better handled if we gotten some kind of Celestia flashback. Like, I think. In terms of, like, fixing the story, the biggest thing that we need to do is really give a lot of insight into Celestia's relationship with Sunset and the director. I don't want to get too deep into it because there's just so much, there would be so much to fix with Act, just specifically Act 3. Act 1, Act 2, they can fine. They're fine. You don't need to change anything. Act 3 was so badly handled, especially in the last couple of chapters, like last four or five chapters. Oh, it's, it was so, it was just, just a mangled mess. But I, at least, if there's one thing that I think should be fixed, it is, it would probably be, it would probably be just the reveal. What I would do with the reveal is one or two things. One, leave the reveal that Twilight is an MI as a sequel hook. So that way you keep it, you put it at the end. So that way you have way more anticipation for the story for anyone who wants to actually, who's very interested in the story. So you have, you have that anticipation. You have that build up. You have, you have this like, how would this author handle this monumental reveal of Twilight not being human, like Church not being human or not even a ghost? Or, and eat, or you can keep the the reveal as is, but we're given some kind of background into Celestia's relationship with the director and Celestia Shimmer. Just anything, like any, I would have appreciated like a part of Act, like say Act Two, like have the climax, have the climax of Act Two or the beginning of Act Three, solely de dedicated to Twilight to the relationship and background of Celestia, of Sunset, and, and the director. Anything. You could have made it a chapter or two. Just anything to kind of make the reveal more realistic and less disappointing. It's just, it under-delivered. It just... And if the author wants me to actually kind of talk more about, you know, fixing the story, like fixing Act 3 in detail. He has to ask, like I said, there's so much to change 
in Act 3 that I can easily just make that a story by itself. But I think that should, that's, it's fine as, it, like, I still would recommend it up to a point. But I just think the story would have been, this, that climax would have been more palpable if we're give if the execution of twi of the reveal of Twilight being an AI was just better handled. I think, yeah, I yeah I probably still would have had problems with Act Three, but they would have been more tolerable because honestly, this was just a such a bad, badly handled reveal that it, it, it literally reminded me of when I was a kid and my me and my grandfather were watching late nineties. World Championship Wrestling, and then there's just some nonsensical direction. Like I turned he, like I turned into a bad guy just because. And it's like, do you have any explanation? No, because it's I am. It's like, why? Because I am. And then my grand, and then me and my grandfather, you know, are screaming Ru Vince Russo's name because we kind of my grandfather loved wrestling, but he kind of kind of knew he kind of even he kind of knew about Vince Russo despite him being like. Like in his mid sixties at the time, like early mid sixties at the time, he kind of knew. Even he knew about Vince Russo, <laughs> but but I I I wanted to talk about this specific part of the story because it was such it was such a badly handled part that I I, I at least wanted to talk about this and in in some sort of detail like. If there's any like really I could like I said it could, if there's any background on Celestia and the director this would have been ha this would have been better but as it is it's just it's just really just it's just really disappointing it's just a underwhelming reveal that that really could have been that really could have and should have been handled better and I will, you know, like I said, if the author wants me to go into, a, like, make a separate video on what 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 I change, then, you know, that's going to be up to the author. Because there's just, again, so much to change in that in Act 3 that I would have to dedicate an entire video to. Uh, favorite part, honestly, would be the whole conversation between Griff and Fluttershy. After Fluttershy reveals that, that Griff's sister died i really love the humanity of grip i was i actually despise actually despise griff him and dona are literally my least favorite characters i don't like them i can kind of go suck fuck off uh never like i literally never liked grip the author made literally did the impossible and made me like Griff, even for like a, even for like one small part of the story after that i stopped liking griff um it's kind of sad with you know Grip crying and realizing he was Manny and stuff like that. That and then the reveal that his sister's probably is actually dead. It was very sad. It was very emotional. I also love the little and like the little end part of that where he's hugging Fluttershy and Fluttershy realizes oh he's not hugging Fluttershy. He's hugging the closest. He's in essence saying goodbye to his sister because he sees Fluttershy as a sister in a weird meta in a meta, in a weird metaphorical way. Because uh, Fluttershy acts so much like sister just before she be turns into what you see in the Blood Cult Chronicles. But that's my review of I Against I, Me Against You. Uh, I, I, then I leave the possibility of a part two of this video up to the author. And this has been Dark Symphony 777. And cut. <laughs>